Hi everyone, a quick note before we launch into today's video. Applications for CADA 5 of our IPSA professional training course are now open for start in September 2022. If you feel that you have a calling towards depth psychology or psychotherapy and would like to train professionally under Steve and Pauline Richards in psychosystems analysis, then you are more than welcome to apply. We really look forward to reading your application. Check the link in the description and pinned comment for the application webpage. Thanks everyone. Now, on to the video. Hello, Professor. How Hello, are you? Professor. Hi. Well, how are you all doing? Can you hear us? Yes. Can oh, you yeah. hear me? Got you now. Got you now. <laughs> Very good. The, the lights are drawing in here again, so we're, we're in shadow. <laughs> oh, it's dark. Oh, yeah. Little dark. Well, you can see where I'm at. Oh, oh wow. that's much better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's well, it's in the afternoon here in Montana. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Must be really nice. Well, it we, is. It's very nice. We, we've had two days of summer, so we moved kind of straight into the autumn now yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. I'd actually probably like that. I'm not a big fan of summer, actually. <laughs> Just missed out completely. Yeah, a couple of days of 40 degrees we heat, did. and that was it. And now it's less than half that, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Wow. Very strange. <laughs> so, um, so my idea for today was to talk about um, initiation themes and dreams, something the Jungians love to talk about. Oh, they do. Um, and of course, I am a Jungian, so I have to, <laughs> I have to jump in on that action as well. Um, I know you guys have uh, some differing positions and opinions on that, but that's cool. That's great. Um, so I thought I would start off with um, a book that just came out. Um, okay. What did I do with that? It is a book that I cannot figure out what I did with, but it's okay. Yeah. It's called <laughs> It's called uh, the the Young uh, Young's Archetype Concept by Professor Christian Rusler of um, uh, he's a German professor, and it's a great book. Uh, I do have some issues with it, but that, that's a like subject for another day. But what I, what really jumped out at me was this dream that he presented of one of his patients in the book. So I, I feel confident to repeat this because it's already been published anyway, and it's not my patient. Um, and he starts off with this, and, and it's got an initiation theme to it, to the dream. Um, so there's a patient that he had who had been stagnating for many years. He'd, he'd lived in the house of his parents who had died when he was rather young. Um, and he had this really crippling depression, just a lack of motivation, a sense of meaninglessness and emptiness. Um, he was very depressed. Um, and he had this dream while he was in therapy with uh, Dr. Rusler, um, where people from an unknown nationality grabbed him and stripped him painted him with clay, hit him and poked him, and then dragged him to this big stone altar that had a huge hole in it. They dragged him through the hole painfully, but then once he emerged, everyone celebrated and they all danced around and they carried him to a big feast and he was celebrated throughout the whole, you know, tribe. Um, and so, uh, you know, obviously you can, you can sense, you can see all of these initiation themes uh, just all over this dream here. Um, and you can see the, the motifs that you see in initiation ceremonies and rituals around the world are, are embedded in this. And, and he didn't have any real background in this. It's something that just sort of emerged from the unconscious in a dream. So my question for discussion today then, well, I was really curious to see what you, you two would think of a dream like this. What, what might you think is the meaning of it? Thank you. I haven't read that book, but what, what I will say is this is a good book. <laughs> this is a very good book, and I recommend it. I, I, I know that author. I think he's, he's yeah, on to something. He's very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I've not seen that book, um, but the concept... It just came out, so it's really new. Right. Thank you. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll make sure to look it up. Um, the context that you've given makes it significant, because obviously the context is everything. Yeah. And, um, we would naturally just accept that as being that which manifests itself. Um, we wouldn't try and interpret it away. Ah, okay. um, we, we'd we'd um, go along with the presentation of it. And um, 
what I would routinely do, working through that with all of the respect that is, that is due for such a thing, at a specific point, I would try and ask, try because the communication channel has to be open, try and ask the unconscious to further explain beyond the manifest symbols what the, the deep structure meaning might be. Mm. And we do that to avoid what can go wrong with amplification sometimes with, with um, if, if we're too strictly young in an approach, in our experience anyway, that you can get a, a position where we get almost a folie de of fantasies going on based on, on, on shared suggestion and things move away from the compensation of the dream. And then we might find the dreams compensate for the interpretation mm. wrong. The dangers of not sticking to the image, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Um, we find obviously naturally enough that the humanistic therapies don't interpret dreams. They say that in their view, the clients as they call them is the best expert on themselves. Well, I don't think that's the case. Otherwise they wouldn't be in the state that they're in. Right. But, that's what I say. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, um, the, the Jungian um, enthusiasm for amplification and interpretation can go too far. Yeah. Yeah. So, get, get a little bit too happy with that. Yeah, so our position based on pretty much everything else we do is, is to try to find the right moment to ask the unconscious to explain further. That, that's as simply as, as I, I can put it. So in a way, that would be the transcendent position between the other two. Um, and we do have an evolved view, I guess, of, uh, of Jungian dream theory, and we kind of default back to Freud in some regards um not completely but but in part how so would you say well it, it's really to do with the 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 view that Jung had that there was no such thing as a, as a manifest sorry a latent content to a dream mm. manifest content and of course he, he made these statements when he was breaking away from Freud and it was quite yeah. heated. um and he may not have really meant it to be that reductive but he, he did say that there was no such thing as a dream sensor for example the dream presents as it is um, therefore, there is only the manifest content and there's no latent content, which which is disguised. He says that and then he says you have to interpret the symbols of the dream, which imply immediately that there is a latent content between or behind that which manifests. Mm. So there's, there's a literal issue there that may not be a true issue because he may well have understood better what he meant than what he was communicating when he said yeah. that there is no uh, latent content. Yeah. But what we do is we say, OK, there, there's two personalities, uh, their experiences and their theories collapsed into those personalities, came out the other end as psychoanalysis and analytical psychology, very much predicated on their personality. So what's the bridge? And we thought that the bridge is to ask the other within uh, on the assumption that that knows what it's doing, even if we don't. And even if the, the, the patients or the client themselves doesn't know. Uh, and that's congruent with respect to the way that we treat approaching the cycle. Right. Yeah. So, so we, it's... we would ask, what does this mean? Because we don't understand respectfully, really respectfully. Sure. And that's a nuanced process. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine uh, you would have to set that up to where the, the respect was accepted and believed. Yes. First. Right. So you might have to make, you have to, there's many ways you have to do that. I imagine communicating yeah. on many channels, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. Uh, I think the class, so the classical interpretation of, of this would be that the dream says exactly what it means. And if you were to ask, just playing devil's advocate here, if you were to ask, I think the, a classical sort of response to that would be that the dream is in symbols because symbols are the best way to communicate whatever it is. Yeah. But what you're saying is that it's not quite that bad that you can actually ask the unconscious, hey, I didn't understand that. Could you elaborate a little bit more and <laughs> help me to figure out what that means? That you'll actually get a creative answer that will assist you yes. in that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's unusual if people are unfamiliar with that um, because you do have to set aside as far as is possible an interpretive theory, except to say that the so-called unconscious is not ego consciousness that they're, they're qualitatively different uh, and what emerges initially is a statement for sure uh, uh, as you were saying uh, on yeah. what the position is on the inside but it doesn't mean that it's been put in 
a means which is easily accessible to consciousness. It's simply a statement. And right. Jung's notion on compensation, that the dream might compensate for the attitude of the ego, would suggest that you, you would expect that. You would expect a simple statement which is in some way compensatory to the ego's position. That's fine if the ego is completely ignoring the unconscious and not making any attempt to approach it. But if it makes an attempt to approach it, we should expect a reaction to that. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, given that the dream images are always what they are, but combined with the perception of the ego. Yeah. And it can change with time as as I begin to have a different understanding of like my usual example I give is uh, threatening characters or monsters chasing you. And if you in the dream turn around and face those characters, they oftentimes become a whole lot less demonic or threatening. But it must be the same thing that's being expressed. But now the ego attitude has changed the meaning. I also think that you're probably right, too, because dream, a dream, a given dream is not the final answer. It's the latest answer to what the genome thinks needs to happen, I would say. Right. So, I mean, asking it is now changing the rules. No. And so you might get a better answer that way, certainly. I guess the, the the lesson then for us to take home from this is that in your all's experience, um, it, it's kind of like religion, you know, like people wringing their hands or what does God want for me? And somebody comes along and says, well, why don't you just go ask him? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Same kind of thing here. It's like, well, what does the unconscious want? You know, what is it trying to mean? Well, why don't you just ask it? Yeah. Simple, but probably highly effective. Yeah. Um... The, the problem, of course, is that the language of ego consciousness is not the language of the unconscious. So, right, yeah, you got to translate. Yeah, it's that metaphor we use of uh, going back to the 19th century, the, the sort of, you know, the, the high point of the British Empire. The Englishman abroad speaks to the locals who don't understand him, so he shouts louder, thinking that's <laughs> true. Well, the ego, if it does that, will get a similar response to the 19th century Englishman abroad. It might be unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, spirit of the face. It's been avoided. Right. So if, if we respectfully say, I, thank you, I'd like to understand more and then be patient, then there's usually a response. And we have a few other little things that we do as well when, when we uh, engage with, with, uh, with, with dreams mm. to help to open up that, that channel of communication. So... Um... Now, uh, if you were to speculate, then, um, given that we don't have this patient here to ask directly like that, what might you think the meaning of this dream is? Or if you've seen dreams like this in other folks, you know, what's a common answer to that that you get? Well, I would say that it's, it's latent potential, and we go back to manifest and latent again, although there's a manifest content that represents itself in or to ego consciousness when the ego is in the dream ego state that's unlikely to be being lived out so it's in potentia and therefore latent so it represents latent potential or a push from instincts and therefore the genome anticipating a future that is possible and it represents itself as a process which is attainable but the ego is not articulated to that at this stage, hence the dream compensates in that traditional young new ways, but, but it, will, it will present in that way. Mm. And that might be why it would present as a quote unquote primitive ritual like this, even though he doesn't live in a society like that. Yeah. Right? The disconnect between where the way he's living now and the way the dream presents, I think is significant. Yeah. We, we would take that as being an indication of a meta instinct, which Jungians, of course, call archetypes. Yeah. And a, a quick way a, a, of accessing that is to, is to find an affect pulse, which um, very often is concealed. It is li literally latent behind a dream image, which someone can articulate about very clearly. And they say, this is this, this is that. Uh, but if they can find a glimpse or feel a glimpse of what is behind the manifest content, the first thing that happens is you get a confirming affect pulse, which is mm. something from the unconscious that's coded. The, the, the superpositioned information is in an affect charge at that point uh, and it announces, yes, that's a signal. Yes, you're on the right track. Feel this. And what they do about the feeling then is important because the feeling being a pulse is likely to be overwhelming, but there will be a vague impression of something 
just behind even the emotion at that point. And that's the indication of the direction to go. And that's so point, like in this case, how would you how would you do that? How would you propose something that you might get a pulse like that from in this instance? Well, obviously, we would we'd, 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 um, we'd hear the narrative explained and depending on the state of the person, they, it might be just a cognitive thing. They literally just describe it with no feeling connection at all. And uh, we, we've noticed very often therapists will try to at that point to induce a feeling in the person even if they just say, well, what does that mean to you? And you'll usually find the person stirs off and has to recalibrate their attention cognitively to try to construct something because they've been interfered with at the moment when they were about to shift from cognition into affect. So we, we have the complete story, first of all, and then just ask them about a part of it which may indicate something to them about what it really means, whatever that might be. And then just say something at the right moment. What what do you think is just behind that? Mm. Uh, for example, I know that that's a, a, a you know not a particularly good way of phrasing it because this is an abstraction. But it, in essence, that's what we're looking for. And 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 very often they'll they'll get it the affect charge and say, oh, where does that come from? I don't know what that means. That mean it means something. And and they might they might actually start to to cry. You know, to have yeah. a, to have a, a true ab reaction. A change in respiration, a, a big sigh, or something like, or all of those, and then they might say, "I know what it means," but they can't say it. So at that point, they're in a dissociative state. They know that the affect means that they know, but they can't access the affect level of consciousness because they're still in cognition. Okay. But they're actually going away from the dream, but inwardly away and not outwardly away. The, the usual Jungian method of amplification moves them away outwardly away not inwardly away but the inwardly away is actually a deepening of, of connection to what lasts uh, or, or what lies behind it and there may well be then that narrative that starts to open up and once they, they start to articulate that then with encouragement they can start to deepen that and, and go into a very primitive state of, of association to their instincts and whoa uh, that can get i know from my own experience personal experience that gets really powerful yeah, yeah, I've had experiences like that in therapy myself too, and it does get intense. If, and I, I think that you're right that there is um, that is an error that is made in therapy sometimes is taking the imagery and then flying off into massive, you know, worldwide connections and amplifications on stuff, and you're you're losing the the reason why this person had this dream right now. Mm. Right, and you know, so it's best I think to try to do that in your head. To maybe get some feel for where it is and then try to move towards well what what are these images representing for you what is like you say right behind that what's the affect yeah. that is being clothed in those images yeah. to use warren coleman's phrase yeah. um and so like what kind of a question would you ask to get that for this person i'll, I'll start with what i wouldn't do if that's okay and and, and that yeah. was, uh, <laughs> only because it provides the ground for the figure so to speak but what I wouldn't do is analyze every detail and, and say, okay, you put on the clay, you, 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 you pass through this, this stone, that's a rebirth. You know, I'm, I'm already telling him what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm stepping away and that's, that's me and it's not him and it's not his dream. And I would ask right. the unconscious would resist. And it, how it resists at that point is to withdraw communication in the moment. And we're left on the level of cognition. And that cognition is suggestion because if the patient accepts it, then they're listening to hopefully a rationalistic statement about the report of the dream, but they're not engaged with it emotionally at all. And so they come away with a superficial sensation they've been understood. And afterwards, the yawning gap with the affect, which is there, but uh, exercising a gravitational pull on their, on their ego that makes them feel a bit, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, mm -hmm. that tells them, no, that wasn't satisfactory at all. So that's what we don't do. <laughs> okay good i agree with that <laughs> so um some of the demonstration tapes that i've done for ipsa with mm. james where he's uh, gone into dreams again using imagery um allows the unconscious to have its say and the interesting thing for us is that the unconscious doesn't do that by choice through speech it does it through other channels of expression 
initially. So what we're looking for basically is to superposition what is unconscious into consciousness so they're right. in a state and they translate directly and, and then the person gets the sense of meaning. And, and to do that, we have to find the signals that the unconscious is, is delivering in that moment and favors at that time. And again, this is where a hypnotic or altered states of consciousness modality is very, very useful because a person can actively, but in a relaxed way, observe their unconscious beginning to move physically through them or through an affect uh, change, uh, through uh, a whole process of imagery coming through without being pressured and then deciding to speak when they want to. And then we can start to talk directly to the unconscious mind of whoever that person is. We can talk to both. It, it gets very weird and you start to feel things yourself because it's a it's a relational field. Yeah. Where you, you, you're picking up something that resonates with yourself. And that's a very deep level of, of rapport um, and, and things can can uh, progress very quickly. Then it's, a, it's an exhausting process. Uh, because your, your, your whole physiology becomes attuned to the experience of the other, which is being detected and exchanged. All right. So you end up with this kind of, uh, well, that that would, I think, be typically labeled as like a, a manifestation of a transcendent function. Yeah. I think, uh, or you could call it an analytic third if you wanted to. Um, you can do that very oh, quickly. Using, yeah. You see, it doesn't take a long time. You, you just have to do the right things. Mm -hmm. And the communication occurs just that we don't have to wait years to be able to dream the dream mm -hmm. is a natural process so if, if we facilitate that communication channel the unconscious will manifest immediately in the way that it needs to the theory gets in the way yeah again yeah and it's supposed to clarify things but sometimes it, it sort of runs on its own motor and flies off into outer, outer space <laughs> But in this case, in this case, so then what you're saying is what you would have them do is uh, go kind of back into the, back into the dream, right? Sort of immerse themselves into the dream. Yeah. Uh, and in a, in a way of helping them access sort of an unconscious answer to the question of what is the meaning behind this? Yeah. If, if, if the, the patient was to say, I am being reborn. And I haven't said, or Pauline and Ivers have said that, that's completely different than, than one of us saying, that's a ritual rebirth. That yeah. is, the gap between those two statements yeah. is vast. Yeah. If they say it, you know, they're very close, they're almost there. And then you would want to know what that feels like for them. Do you know what I would no, want? I'm probably not. No, <laughs> what, what we want to know is what it means. Yes, yeah. And... The only reason for us to want to know what it means is it would have to pass through him to be able to articulate what that means. Mm -hmm. So it'd go from instinct to affect consciousness to cognitive consciousness and then psychosocial. And that would all line up because it came from within and hadn't been imposed from without. Ah, OK, so it's kind of like making sure all of the channels are aligned with like a bunch of Swiss cheese, right? All the holes have to be there or if you get that right at the uh, are, are you, unconscious. Professor, are you familiar with Doctor Who at all? No, I'm not. I've heard a lot about it, but I've never you seen it. You know a lot about, about sci-fi and, and, and the like. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> That's one I've never gotten into yet, but well, uh, I plan to. The original series has, uh, is, is very interesting for me anyway, because I, I remember it in 1963 when it was first broadcast. And the uh, the character of the Doctor regenerates within that universe into a different personality, a different configuration. And uh, on occasion, over the original 30 years or so that it, that it was running, uh, one or more of these personalities would be present at the same time for a specific task. Because mm. the universe decided it needed more than one version of them. And in, in one scenario, there's a guy who was very much a practical sensing type in the Jungian sense, and another who was all over the place and intuitive, and they were mm. trying to solve a problem. And the problem was laid out on a sarcophagus in script. And the intuitive said, what does that mean? And the sensing type read it out, mm. read out exactly what it said. And the intuitive said, I know what it says, but what does it mean? <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. Yeah. They, they were both right. Mm -hmm. Both right. The guy who read it out knew what it meant, 
but he didn't communicate what it meant. He only said what it meant. Mm -hmm. But the other guy wanted to know what is the meaning behind the manifestation of the script that will solve the problem for us. And because they were opposites in a Jungian sense, sensing and intuition, they're actually in conflict with one another. You got two partial answers, but they were, and it took the thinking type guy to, to turn up and sort them both out. <laughs> of, course. of course, of course, yeah. And it was a feeling type that there were four of them, and each one of them manifested uh, that kind of thing. But the, the 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 metaphor there for me is, what does it mean? I know what it says because you told me, but what? Mm -hmm. does it mean? Once I know what it means, and he then that person knows what it means, then the, the channel opens and we get somewhere. Wow. Uh, okay. So. Um... Then just kind of further speculating here, since we don't have the patient with us to to experiment on. <laughs> um, why might you think that someone would have a dream with tribal, uh, this sort of tribal initiation elements to it? Well, well how about you, Paul? I'm, I'm OK on that one. How about you? What do you think? Well, I, I think we, we would have to um, say that there's some kind of instinctive pressure there for maybe some new form or phase of adaptation, um, trying to make itself known. And, um, you know, we're, we're not of today. We, we, we are ancients, you know, the way the brain yeah. evolved as well is, is uh, you know, the... Wow. Um, the, uh, the deeper structures are very ancient and uh, to some extent, um, you know, we, we still have those same instincts, um, it, the ones that were formed way back, you know, in Paleolithic times back in the old Stone Age. So um, it, it to me, it just suggests really that the, the something has to be done with that instinctive pressure and um, you know, I was thinking before we, we sort of came on air tonight um, about some of the, I know I'm moving away a little bit from the example that we're talking about now, but it, it, it's to do with sort of the, the Jungian take on these things. And um, it was a Jungian analyst who, who um, has to some extent stepped away from her work now, unfortunately, but her name is Clarissa Pinkola Este. She probably familiar with her, wrote a, a book called Women Who Run With The Wolves. And um, she talks about things like dark man dreams, that women have these dark man dreams when um, they're being required from within to uh, enter a new phase of adaptation or to, um, to update themselves with respect to their consciousness and their, their maturation and, and so on. And as far as it as far as it goes, I can kind of excuse the pun run with that. Um, but the the problem I have with it too is that she then tends to uh, reify it by talking um, about the negative animus and um, how if uh, women don't take on board um, you know the message from the animus, then it will act as a destructive force within them and all this kind of stuff. And I just think that's moving further and further away from the point really which for me is one again of uh of instinctive pressure more than anything mm -hmm. else. I just just think that's a, a a cleaner way a safer way to come at it than to start to reify the content in that way so uh, I know it's a bit of an aside from what we're talking about but um that's why we tend to fall back mm. I think on instincts as much as we do mm. Mm. Well, I, I certainly agree with that. I mean, I, I write about instincts all the time. Of course you do. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, so, okay. So it sounds like you're, you're saying that um, the reason why these sort of tribal initiation elements in it pop up is because that is a ancient way of solving this problem of stagnation that he's experiencing. And it's at this moment anyway, the psyche is saying, this sort of thing needs to happen. Yeah. Um, and that the instincts are pushing towards that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I agree too that it is dangerous to overly to get overly involved with the you know labeling of this is the animus and that is the, yeah. the shadow and all that kind of thing, because yeah. then you can get lost. Um, I always remind myself of uh, something Jung said in one of his seminars was that learn everything you can about symbolism and then forget about it when you walk into the room. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So it's like be prepared to to 
potentially look and see that if it, if it's there, but at the end of the day, still, you don't want to put that on them. You want to see what's actually there. Stick to the image. You know, he kept saying that. Yeah. yeah. But I think the, the tendency for some of uh, some of his followers to do stuff like that was probably why he said, thank God I am young and not a young Ian. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, I think you you're right to emphasize that idea of putting theory in the way and um, it, it's easy to do particularly I think when maybe we don't know somebody very well and um, th there's all you know the, the angst in that person for you to help them solve their problems and you guess further if you do that get further and further away from your own ability to literally feel into where that person is and, and where they're going and if you say something at the wrong moment as I think Steve was saying earlier um you know you ask them how they feel or you interject in some other way um when they're about to uh have some kind of meaningful experience essentially you you rob them of it mm. if you're not careful um and it it's it's a hard thing to articulate because it's a very nuanced thing really but this this idea of um that that kind of deep rapport that you have with somebody that, that guides you that guides you through the process it is very hard to articulate mm -hmm. and um it does require you to let go of you know over analyzing things yourself in the moment with that person and it can it can feel you know we can feel a bit um would be the right word a bit scary almost to, to do that sometimes because it you know there's a kind of to some extent you have to um you have to go with the process. I mean Jung would also say things too like you know uh, that he he would be in the soup with that other person and to some extent you are without being necessarily mm. you know sort of lost in it but but you just very very attuned I think yeah. uh to what they're going through and um mm. I, I guess it's just something that the more that you do it the more comfortable that you get with it yeah um, there's uh, some interesting writing by uh Heinz Kohut on that uh mm. talking about the difference if you're familiar with his work uh between yeah. sympathy and empathy and how empathy is the primary tool that we use yeah. in therapy yeah um and and I think the tendency to overanalyze and whatever is probably it's probably a newbie error because you go in and you know you don't have any idea what's going on but you've got this comforting theory you can fall back on and go oh i know what this is you know? so there might even be some inflation there too that's tempting us to to jump on the gun there and you know and say oh well this is clearly blah 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 you yeah. know but that's not really what you should be doing yeah. I mean, it's still informing you. I mean, you you know, I, as you you're going through that per, uh, process with that person or sharing that process with them, it's it's not that um, you're not aware of what might be going on. You know, you still you can still have that tape running in your head. It's just that you're not so focused on it that you allow it then to intrude on something which is potentially a, a very very special very profound moment for someone and uh, i think as steve was suggesting sometimes it happens so quickly i think it can take everyone by surprise um so you, you kind of have to be prepared for it but um you know you you still have different channels running mm. don't you whilst you you're doing what you're doing um and so it's possible um afterwards to maybe think more analytically about things and, and to have a, a kind of a, a, a deep brief with yourself or with the person concerned or with whoever's doing your supervision. But at, in that moment, it, it's so important to think not to disturb that channel as it opens up. It's very tempting to sometimes as well, particularly if there's maybe a long silence or, um, you know, you're not quite sure yourself where, where that person's at. You know, there's a little bit of a mismatch with, in your energy with their energy. And, you, you know, it's, it's all of that. Uh, and like I said, it's very nuanced. But I think you... Dance. <laughs> yes, it is. It is, yeah. definitely. Yes. But you do know for sure, I think, as Steve said, that um, if they offer something themselves rather than you impose it and they say, well, that was like a rebirth for me and they, it's come from them, that's so much more powerful than imposing it. Right, right. 
right? Because you, you know, you can listen. This maybe is what Jung means by learning about it, but then forgetting it is to yeah. say, like, like you say, keep it in the back of your head. You know, because I'm yes, hearing this did. dream, I'm like, oh, okay, this has got a whole lot of tribal rebirth, uh, you know, yeah. initiation into yeah. adulthood, da, da 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 da, all that kind of stuff. But if I say that, I'm messing it up. I'm messing up the field. Yes. Which, yeah. which of course, I agree with that. I, I don't do that. Yeah. Um, now, and one thing I try to do too, though, is always ask myself, why is it this way and not some other way? Why is this, if, if, if we're right, and this is a dream expressing an instinctive push mm -hmm. to, to progress and mature out of this state of stagnation, mm -hmm. which I think is probably, probably the case, but then why is it presenting like this, like a primitive so-called ritual, uh, this very removed from his his actual life experience is that because it's just so distant from the ego that it's going to manifest like that like this is something that that we need to that the instincts are saying this is something you need to go through but but you don't have a clue so it's kind of like this thing from ancient times right you know the, the two million year old self is talking at this point um but what, what are your thoughts on that I think that's very a very interesting point. And as Pauline was uh, talking then, uh, and you said as well, Professor, about uh, the rebirth element, if um, we wanted to induce a trance, when somebody says that, that's uh, this sounds awful, but it's an ambush opportunity. <laughs> uh, and by that, I mean uh, that the, the ego is in a position that it's placed itself by its own articulation, which it will only be partially conscious of, about using the that that term to be moved from that state of self-reflection in the moment into something else which we could call metaphorically an ancestral state of resonance so to, to, to get off away from the complexity of what I've, I've just said it would be something along the lines of and when were you first born and only say that and then and you're doing something else as if you'd said it under your breath but you you say it very directly when was he first born uh, and then if he doesn't say anything and he, he's sitting there and he's contemplating it, perhaps in a dissonant way, that's OK, because that's the door is now open. The dissonance provides the door for you to begin to ask the psyche to take him back to when such a ritual meant so very much. Mm. And then to, to begin to feel that connection with an ancestral spirit. So something which appears incongruent now because it has... A very primitive, paleolithic, perhaps mesolithic, certainly overlay mm. to it. Then surely we should invite the ego to allow itself to go back into that context. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. So you could say that it's that way for a very specific reason. But in the moment, about whether that's right or not. And if, um, as Paul was saying about the nuance of the report, and you mentioned empathy, similar concept if that's that's presence and you feel it within you and it'll very often be a somatic register yeah. you'll feel it in your guts mm. you have to you say you will it. the therapist you mean yes yeah okay okay but you have to say it um and then you have to watch yourself that you don't take the journey over and do it for them mm -hmm. but, but you're simply present but separate from them uh, and that's a dissociative framework again it's saying i'm not going to associate myself to this person's experience insofar as to control it but simply to make a statement at what appears to be the right moment and a justification for that is that they have said it and i often say to people that their unconscious so-called however we conceive of that is presence and monitoring the situation and the very always often, listening yes mm. uh, and very often people say things and they catch that I didn't actually say that so much as it said itself. So therefore, there is the other presence. And again, depending on how well we've prepared someone very subtly with um, analogically marked anchors that we can then go back to and align again, a person can get back into that state of, yeah, this is the time and the moment and I'm on my way. Uh, uh, you feel it it's part of the rapport field and as you said earlier if the unconscious trusts you they're unconscious and your own unconscious trusts you to do what you're trying to do then there's, there's that's part of that informational field that resonant field and and 
it, it surfaces as what the youngers would call an intuition, probably, and then you go with it. Or they would use maybe the metaphor of the therapeutic window, where there's the, you know, the, the conscious and the conscious talking, and the unconscious of the therapist and the patient talking, uh, you know, at, underneath the radar with that communication yeah. going on. Yeah. And then there's there's of course the cross channels too. Like I'm I'm seeing that you're unconscious doing stuff, and then transference and countertransference. You know. Yeah, you see that in, in, in Jung's work, don't you? A, a lot. Mm -hmm. and I think it's a very handy schemata to to represent what's going on. Um, in, in practice, though, of course, you disregard the schematic representation and go entirely on being present and, and feeling the flow of that of that movement. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting what can happen. It's, uh, um, I spontaneously modeled that as you, you were both speaking, uh, because my own psyche has told me on the basis of experience that is the opportunity to begin a dissociation. And very often it's a deepening or a secondary dissociation because the person's already in that state because they're recounting a dream. So there's a withdrawal of attention in the immediate moment from the environment externally and it's internal. And then they give you a signal which they think they've said and they've offered the statement, but it's come from within. And it's the invitation to help them to take the next step. And you do. It's a kind of functional shamanism. Really, it is, it? yeah. And, and oftentimes uh, when someone um, gets the experience that, that they need and, and there's a state change for them, sometimes there is for you as well. It's not always in a positive direction no. in the same way as it might be, um, you know, uh, in the kind of shamanism that that even um, you know exists in some parts of the world today where, you know, the the. Uh, Basically, it's a transference, well, isn't it? it? Well, it yeah. is. Well, it is. But I think I think to think of it in in those terms automatically gives it a more ancient feel. Oh, it does. And so yeah. it, it it does it trans. You know, because we're talking about um, you know instincts and how ancient they are, and uh, there's just something I think about attuning yourself in that way psychologically to what you're doing that actually changes what you're doing. Yes, it As does, opposed yeah. to saying, "I'm here," you know, and I'm a Jungian analyst, and I'm going to amplify this dream for someone mm -hmm. it's an entirely different mindset to knowing that you may engage in some kind of shamanistic experience with someone yeah. soon and that yeah. you better be ready for it mm -hmm. yeah that's true the uh, and i think this is true about many kinds of therapy yeah. is that it's um it's almost like you take the material that they give you and then you tell them in one way or another, okay, now we're going to go do some homework assignments on this and analyze it over here yes. independently of your lived experience right now in this yes. moment. Yes. We're going to go over here. We're going to analyze it from afar and then we're going to come back and maybe that'll help. And, yes. you know, even when I was a resident, I used to ask myself, as sometimes I would ask questions that they didn't find very amusing, but <laughs> like, okay, so how does this help <laughs> exactly? And, you know, I would get dirty looks from, from some folks, but um, I, I, that's a, a, it's a, it's a problem. It is a problem, you know, and that the, the, the rise of sort of cookbook CBT is another yeah. example of this sort of thing. Yeah. Is I'm taking your, your feelings and your, what you're telling me. And I'm just, it's almost like I'm extracting it and sticking it under a microscope over here mm. rather than saying, let's let's do something right now here in this very instant together it's very much very much like a mantic exercise uh, like you, like you say yeah. well there's a reason why that stuff's so been around for so long yes yeah. mantic yeah. practices have been around forever because they are powerful and effective i remember uh, reading a book called the neuroscience of religious experience by a guy named patrick mcnamara it's really really interesting book I was annoyed at first when I saw it because it was so close to what I was talking about with the neurobiology of the gods when I've read it. But then I actually read it and I realized he was he was actually getting into a very different subject. Yeah. And he was talking about what's going on in the brain and in the mind during these sorts of mantic practices of uh, the dissociative nature of it. If you might find it interesting if you haven't read it. Mm -hmm. It's a really cool book. Mm -hmm. Um, but also warning of the dangers of what can happen and go wrong and inflation and all that sort of stuff too. Uh, it's really interesting. Didn't mention Young at all, but he should have. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. It was very relevant. 
Sorry, just, just to clarify on transference, I did not mean to reduce that to a Freudian or a Jungian interpretation of that, but what's supposed to underlie that as transference, as in the shamanistic transference of yes, something onto true. the other, mm. so that the other bears it in the moment and holds it as a containing vessel. Yeah. Now that can act as a dissociation too, and I've done this, I think I've done it uh, with James on some of the, uh, the videos that we've done for our training courses, well, when he's been in a double situation, a uh, double induction, double, doubly dissociated, then I've allowed or suggested that some things can be projected onto me that will reduce the tension in him at the moment as a complete system. So he can observe himself in a, in a, in a, a less stressed or less pushed way. And the transference then manifested itself completely openly, undisguised, and I was able to contain that without harm to him or to me and that that's a shame that's what i meant mm. by it is a transference in mm. that sense that yes, when it's yes. shame minister you, you take things off you take the illness or you whatever do. it might be yes. metaphor yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that's a very different way of looking at transference from the classical yeah uh, typically pejorative almost way of looking at transference is this sort of negative thing that you have to try to get around or avoid or all that yeah it's it, it transfers well. I, I think of it as uh, again superpositioning. What is within, so too is without. Mm -hmm. Through the the dynamic of transference, so it's the same information, but it collapses into a specific kind of representation. And if it's targeted on us as therapists, it's not pleasant. But if that can be reconfigured and reunderstood and communicated back, even if it's indirectly, then everything changes. The field adjusts. The homeostasis of the field adjusts. So how it's dealt with is important, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Well, um, okay. So I was going to ask, like, what what you would do in a situation like this, but I think you've already answered that question. <laughs> um, I think it, it depends what 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 came up, you know. Obviously, yeah. Uh, but I'd really be interested in his capacity to comfortably separate him, himself from that which comes from within so that which comes from within can express itself and you feel no feel no fear no anxiety nothing like that that's and a really key principle there then i think yeah. for your for your approach isn't it that you yes. you really have to accept the reality of the ego being quite separate from the unconscious so that there can be a real true dialogue i think so many times or the tendency is to just collapse everything onto the well why did you do that or why did you say that you know as if it was only one mm -hmm. singular center of consciousness going on in there yeah right so with the, the the discovery of the unconscious and all these possible different complexes going on all at once we know there's many voices in here but it's not pathological except in a few cases of severe trauma and schizophrenia and stuff other than that it's supposed to function that way Yes, it, it is. So dissociation is normal. Um, yeah. The, the, the first level, I think, of depth is that the field of complexes, as, as we would call them, particularly those identified with by the ego, because there's no separation as such as by definition is identification. And that gets a very crowded place. And yeah. if we don't utilize dissociation, we, we hit that wall and there's a great deal of inertia and distraction amongst these things because they've partitioned in order to deal with something that the ego wasn't able to deal with and then run autonomously and will act against the ego's best interests in favor of the conditions that set the complex up that, that's that's what it does um but if you can get past that so it doesn't even matter that's a that's a very yeah. strange situation for the ego but also for the complexes associated with the ego they start to think, where am I? I don't know. I've lost my orientation. What's going on? Right. Like little satellites, and then they're just spinning off into space now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so right. it's a very interesting experience to um, subjectively to go through that, to actually not be bothered by these little things anymore. Well, you know, uh, Jung talks about the function of consciousness as discernment as dividing and breaking things down so that they can be understood this is the same process on a larger scale yeah if i can't dissociate then i can't i can't allow the elements of the whole to be distinct i just i just jam them all together and it's just this big soup of confusion 
Yeah. All right. So then that makes sense for to use that as a tool. Yes. And of course, when we when we dissociate, we leave the ego in place and we leave it feeling comfortable with itself rather than panicking. And I, I think there's a reasonable uh, reason, so to speak, why we should panic at the idea of fragmenting. Okay. you know because that's that's inclining towards the kind of work that yes. you very often yes. have to do in, in your profession yeah. but if if we're not afraid of that because the ego is stable but separate that's a very different uh, set of circumstances right yeah it is there are actually um quite a bit of research on um kind of the evolutionary background of schizophrenia and there's some theorists that think that the capacity that we have for language imagination and dissociation and all that sort of thing, this, that schizophrenia is kind of um, a side effect of that. Like we evolved these things and that came along with it because if we couldn't do those things, right? It, they serve a purpose, they're, they're functional, we need them. Yeah. And so the, the only way that could have evolved though was with for it to go the potential for it to go too far in which case you would have fragmentation and all that it's it's one of the theories out there but if you've ever heard the theory that um that shamans and and things like that were were schizophrenics and and tribes no uh, they're too disorganized for that schizophrenics are no they might be considered touched by the gods or special or things like that because but they people that actually go through what typical uh, folk magicians and uh, mantic practitioners have to go through to do what they do. Um, I think it would be almost impossible for a schizophrenic to yeah. tolerate because you know, they have to, it's an immense amount of work usually. Yeah, uh, I, I'd agree. And do you, do you think, how do you feel about this? I'd be very interested to hear, obviously, with your experience and, and professional knowledge on, on this. this um, delusional beliefs obviously there are the different levels of intensity and it, it can become psychotic obviously but our own view sometimes is that that appears to be from a psychodynamic perspective the complex is attempting to generate a meta instinct to explain something that is pushing them that, that, that they can't deal with so the delusion it, it very often is systematized obviously and it makes sense from within itself but there's a narrative very often to it and that's very close to the idea of a meta instinct, which should be healing, but it's not healing. So right. it's almost as if there's an attempt to do it. And the reason I think now is that my experience with complexes is they do something similar. They, they will generate a, a pseudo meta instinct mm -hmm. as an alibi narrative to keep themselves in an ecology that the ego will accept. Yeah. It seems yeah, a lot of times I think they, they are at the service of ego needs um or at least ego desires um particularly like folks that have um and this is kind of the 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 gray area between the psychodynamic and the psychotic you know that Jung was so good at and at identifying because of the patients he worked with um but like a, a person who has this paranoid belief that he's being watched and followed all the time that that tends to happen in folks that are very isolated and so the, what you, you, you do the same thing with the, with the delusions that you would with a dream or with any other sort of symptom dynamically is ask yourself, what is this thing doing for that person? And in this case, it's sort of like saying, I'm important enough for these vague entities to be following me around and monitoring my otherwise completely mundane and, and you know, uninteresting day-to-day <laughs> -day activities. Um, you know, why anybody would go through the trouble of monitoring me wandering around in, in my kitchen, uh, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. But the ego is not strong enough to handle that. It's too fragile. And so it hangs on to this narrative. I have one patient who, um, who believed that she was royalty, descended from Queen Victoria, and um, that and she would drive her family crazy because she was... Um, constantly telling, you know, telling them the story about how they stole her from the royal family and, and they were just, you know, fed up with all that sort of talk. Um, you know, but uh, what does that sort of narrative do? I mean, it's a classic archetypal narrative of the sort of divine child uh, story or the, uh, the hero, the hero's journey. 
kind of thing. You know, they've got this divine background and, and all that kind of thing. So it services the, I'm, I'm important. Yeah. yeah. You know, that in a very, very blunt sort of way. Yeah. So does that, I think that, I, that, that I'm agreeing with what your interpretation of those things are. Thank you. Well, that's very helpful and very enlightening. That, yeah. So I think it does what you say it does, that it's, it is there for a purpose, but it's, um, it's kind of pulled off from the, the greater, the greater picture, the bigger picture. It's more like the ego is in such dire straits here. It's so fragile. It needs something to hold it together. And so we're going to come up with this, like you say, alibi narrative, but I like that term, you know, mm -hmm. to, to keep it together for right now. It's yeah. A, it's kind of like an abscess. Yeah. In the immune system. All right. Okay. We can't defeat this thing. So we're just going to wall it off and hope for the best. And, and that is how complexes function too, as well. And, and yeah, and fantasy when it's um, wrongly attributed, should we say, as being something that's positive, only where it's wrongly attributed, performs a similar function for a neurotic ego rather than a fragmented mm. uh, schizophrenic one, perhaps, as you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating stuff. It is, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I really enjoyed, well, we both do really mm -hmm. enjoy talking with you. All right, well, um, that, that, that's what I wanted to talk about and uh, get into today with you guys. So I really appreciate you all sharing your thoughts and your Thank you. uh, methods are just absolutely fascinating. Thank you. And Paul, you wanted to- I was just going to uh, briefly yeah. add to what you, you were saying, because it's a you know very, very sort of interesting subject, but it's partly too why we, we tend to not chase complexes unless we absolutely have to, mm. because as you rightly say, for some people, you know, it they would they would fracture under that pressure. And, and to some extent, you know, you have to kind of respect the narratives that have been put in place to protect the yeah. So, um, yeah, it's uh, if, if you can do the work from the inside out without that mm. person even knowing it's yeah. taking place, it's probably the yeah. safest way to do it. What I did for for that one particular patient with the, the Victorian ancestry I said I, I didn't do I didn't challenge it or, or fight it um, yes. because obviously it wasn't that wasn't going to get me anywhere um, instead I worked with okay so now that you're here now what mm. and um, she said well I guess I'm just going to have to to accept the fact that even though I have this special background you know I may not ever get to to really reconnect with it yeah. And, you know, maybe that's okay. Mm. And I thought, well, okay, all right. <laughs> I, I didn't give her that answer. I, I was asking her what she thought it meant because it's just a kind of question you tend not to ask folks with, yes. yeah. with delusional beliefs. Cause you don't, you know, I guess there's this fear that we're going to make it worse by encouraging them. You know, but it doesn't work like that. Yeah. You, you can't create delusions, right? They, <laughs> they build them up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They come from within, don't they? Yeah, they, they do. Yeah. Uh, that's When you were speaking about it, I thought it was quite close to the idea of the changeling as well. You know, it's a, it's a, to some extent, yes. it's just a matter of degree, isn't it, as, as to um, how connected people are to the ideas that they have. You know, what, what point does it go from being something that um, is, I guess, basically neurotic to something which is psychotic and therefore... Yeah you know, by definition, a more serious condition. But, um, you know, you can see the elements either way would be the same as in this person maybe um, simply isn't fulfilling their genomic potential in some way. And maybe it's, it's you know, it's the gene, genome um, intruding into psychology, if you like, or trying to make itself known in that way and, and encourage that person to, mm -hmm. to fulfill themselves in the way that they ought to. Um, and yeah. it may be that it's equal and opposite to the extent to which they, they've not done that. Who, who knows? But um, yes, that's, that's certainly a possibility. Yeah. I've, I've seen that yes. work like that. Yeah. 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 And in one person, that might be a fantasy that they've latched on to with mm -hmm. great interest and and passion but they mm. don't truly believe it they're just fascinated with stories like that yes and then in another person that exact same instinctive pressure evolves into a full-blown delusion yes you know for, for neuroscientific reasons of you know <laughs> or you know whatever however it plays out but i think the the instinct behind it like you say is 
is the same. It's really very similar. Yes. Like you're, you have a purpose, you have a, a destiny, you have a specialness to you. That's right. Yes. And and we need you to go out there and find out and do it mm. you know, for, for, for the, the species, for the genome, for whatever. And if the ego can't handle that. Yes. 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 Yeah. It doesn't work. Mm. <laughs> you get these other, other things. Well, wow, we've covered a lot. <laughs> yes, great. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, me well, too. I have too. Yes, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'll, I'll be in touch with you soon. Oh. Yes, we will. We'll talk some more. Great. It'll be wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Blessings, so Professor. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you.